Good evening. My name is Craig Nielsen. I'm a 28-year veteran of the fire service. I've been involved in flashover survival training since 1998. I conducted hundreds of flashover trainings throughout the world, and I'm here today to talk to you about the phenomena of flashover. What is it? What causes it? Well, can firefighters identify, and what steps can firefighters take to either delay or prevent flashover from happening? Flashovers are the number one fire phenomena that kills firefighters today. Unfortunately, even this year, firefighters have been seriously injured or killed due to flashovers. Understanding the warning signs to an impending flashover can greatly increase your chances of survival at any fire. First of all, what is a flashover? There are many different definitions of a flashover. According to Walter and Thomas, a flashover is generally defined as the transition of a growing fire to a fully developed fire in which combustible items in a compartment are involved in fire. The NFPA Guide for Fire and Explosion Investigations defines a flashover as the transition phase in the development of a contained fire in which services exposed to thermal radiation reach ignition temperature more or less simultaneously and fire spreads throughout the space. Drysdale defines a flashover as the transition from a localized fire to a general conflagration within the compartment when all the fuel surfaces are burning. As you can see, there are a lot of different definitions out there. The one that makes the most sense to me as a firefighter is the stage in which the contents and gases are heated to their ignition temperatures and flames break out almost all at once over all the surfaces. Since there are so many definitions out there whirling around, the NFPA decided to simply call such occurrences as Rapid Fire Progress, or RFP. In firefighter's term, a flashover occurs when a room or structure suddenly erupts into fire and becomes fully involved. I think all of us as firefighters have responded to a structure fire with the first in company gives a size up of I have a single family dwelling well involved in fire. Has flashover occurred? Probably. Fire's coming out the doors and the windows. Flashover has probably already occurred based on that size up. But don't let your guard down because perhaps an attached garage, maybe a rear bedroom, could be the potential of a flashover situation. Again, flashover is the most dangerous stage of fire development and occurs between the growth and fully developed stage and can happen in just a matter of seconds. I'll show you where this takes place later in the presentation on this time temperature curve. Again, it's the fire phenomena that kills more firefighters than anything else. This year alone, there have been several firefighters that have been seriously injured and killed due to flashover. It puts an end to any kind of search and rescue effort. If you have fire from wall to wall, ceiling to floor, you will not be able to enter the room to perform a rescue. No longer is it just a content fire. It's actually starting to burn the structural components that will weaken the building. So there are many different types of flashover. A lean flashover is also known as a rollover. That's when you look up and you see those fingers of snakes or fire making their way through the smoky atmosphere. If you're witnessing this rollover, flashover is imminent. The lower flammable limits are about 24% and all that fire is looking for is more oxygen. This is a picture of students in a flashover simulator witnessing that rollover effect. A hot flashover is the most common type of flashover. This is when the room or space suddenly erupts into fire and becomes fully involved. That fire has received enough oxygen to sustain combustion. The heat and energy mushrooming down into the room or space are all heating the contents to their ignition temperature. Then flames break out almost all at once over all the surfaces and the smoke actually ignites. A rich flashover is also known as a backdraft. This occurs when the oxygen content has dropped so low that combustion cannot take place, but the heat of the smoldering fire continues to build up. All it needs is that breath of fresh air and a life-threatening explosion will occur. Backdrafts are pretty uncommon. I've only witnessed one in my career. We actually responded to a theater fire and there was a staircase at the bottom of that theater. Two of the firefighters forced entry into the door and you can see the smoke being drawn back into that staircase. Fortunately, they had all their PPEs on, and when that ball of flame came out that door, it knocked them to the ground. Fortunately, like I said, they were protected, but that ball of flame actually went out and injured the engineer that was uh, operating the pump panel. A delayed flashover is when the main body of fire ignites the accumulated gases and smoke in an adjoining room or even outside of the structure itself. As you can see in this picture, the main body of the fire has ignited the accumulated gases on the outside of the structure and totally engulfing the firefighter climbing the ladder. Even outside the structure, you can be looking for the warning signs of a flashover. Now, what causes a flashover? Well, Deputy Chief Vincent Dunn of the FDNY has done extensive research in the field of flashover. He developed the term thermal radiation feedback. I'll explain what that is in just a moment. 
Some of the variables that play into this feedback, obviously the larger the room, the longer the feedback takes to take place. The ceiling height, the taller the ceiling, the longer the feedback takes to occur. Newer homes are constructed differently than older homes. Most homes today are better insulated than older homes and have better windows and doors. This is great for energy saving, but the problem is that these homes are so well insulated that they keep the heat in and quicken that thermal radiation feedback. The contents in newer homes also include more plastics and synthetic materials as well. These materials have a lower ignition point and create more toxic gases. From a couch to a table, even carpeting, these materials are built with a flammable coating. It's these combustibles that firefighters need to be aware of. A well-ventilated building might go to free burning and never flash. Or, if you can get significant vertical ventilation, as flashover occurs, it will simply go out the opening that we've created. Picture this as the upper burn chamber of a flashover simulator. Let me explain what's happening when you have a burn barrel in the upper part of the burn chamber. Now that the seat of fire is spreading energy and heat to the ceiling level and across the ceiling and down the walls. Everything in nature tries to find a balance, a thermal balance. If I grab a can of Coke, that Coke will start to warm up and my hand will start to cool down. The same thing is taking place inside of that container or space. The heat is being generated. It's being absorbed by the objects in this room. Once those materials have absorbed all the heat they can, they start to radiate that heat back to the center of the room. That's that term, thermal radiation feedback. A more specific explanation is that those materials have actually reached the state of pyrolysis. And that means that they're changing from a solid to a gas. And that gas is carbon monoxide. That's where that term off-gassing comes from. The heat or energy reaches the center of the room. Again, that material can only absorb so much energy and heat, just like a sponge can only absorb so much water. That heat in that space then starts to grow and grow and grow. Not only have all the surfaces in that room reached their ignition temperature, but all of the accumulated gas has reached its ignition temperature all at once, and that's when flashover occurs. Let's talk a little bit about carbon monoxide. Again, think about those accumulated gases at the upper level. It has a 12.5 to 74 percent flammability range, a very wide range. What that means is that you don't have to have that perfect ratio of gas and oxygen for it to ignite. The ignition temperature is 1128 degrees. Why is that important to us as firefighters? It's very important because we're going to teach you how to put water into that environment. What is our expansion ratio of water to steam? The answer I generally get is 1700 to 1. That's at 212 degrees. At 1128 degrees, the temperature of a flashover, your ratio goes up to 4500 to 1. So if we want to cool those gases down and maintain a good environment, we have to apply the water correctly and make sure that we don't take our visibility away and displace those heated gases down upon us. As I mentioned earlier, this is the time temperature curve. As you can see, you have the incipient phase, and as the fire grows into the growth stage, the heat continues to rise up slowly. In other words, the material in the room is absorbing all the heat it can. Once it can't absorb any more heat, the heat will then radiate back to the center of the room. And you can see here the rapid inclination on the chart, and that's when flashover occurs. As you can see, the temperature will then level off, and this is the point that we need to identify is that spike before that flashover occurs. Flashover have definite signs and symptoms. Let's talk about the signs of flashover. These are the things that we can see and identify. First of all, you have heat buildup, no visibility. I have a big question mark next to that no visibility because you can go into a structure and see from one end to the other, not knowing that the ceiling above you has all that accumulated gas just ready to ignite. Rollover, again, that's that preemptive sign a flashover is going to occur. The fingers and the snakes in the smoke. Again, if you're witnessing that rollover, you must try to cool those gases down effectively and get out of the building. Pressurized smoke is another sign. If you're on the outside observing the smoke exiting the building, looking for that kind of pressure that's associated with that smoke. As you can see from the picture, visibility is clear. It doesn't seem that there's a bad fire there. Smoke will always follow that path of least resistance though. So without any vertical ventilation, none has taken place, that smoke will now start to pour out of that front door. Once again, smoke is always associated with heat. Those two go hand in hand. When those gases do ignite, they do it with an explosive force. Ceilings will come down, the heat and smoke will go to the floor, and disorienting firefighters. Flashover symptoms are the things you can't see. What are the symptoms? No or inadequate ventilation, either horizontally or vertically. 
One of the ways the fire service combats flashovers is that they try to coordinate vertical ventilation with aggressive interior attack. Not all departments have that capability. Another symptom is that we do not get water on the seat of the fire and the fire will continue to grow. As you can see in this picture on the left hand side, there's a window there fully involved in fire. But in the front room, as you can see, there's a little rollover and billowing smoke. Firefighters can be drawn into that room and if they encounter some kind of delay or rescue element into that first room without putting water on the seat of the fire, they could potentially be caught in a life-threatening situation. Live fire training, why do it? Well, as firefighters, we're not getting that hands-on experience that we used to in the past, and that's a good thing. We have better alarms, sprinkler systems. I used to work in an area with a lot of high-rise apartments that now have sprinkler systems. Years ago, it would have been a rip-roaring fire. And today, it ends up being a water removal because of the sprinkler system. The advances in our PPEs. We are so encapsulated, so we're so well protected that we put ourselves in an environment that isn't safe. Again, 20 years ago, before the implementation of firefighting hoods, our ears were the indicators. When you started to feel that sting, you got down on your knees. When they started to sting a lot, you got out of the building. Today, we have to rely on what we see and what we feel to make good decisions. We get to witness all the different stages of fire development from the incipient all the way to the flashover stage. This is very important to understand what stage of the fire we're in when you arrive on scene. This container training is a Class A product that allows firefighters the ability to see firsthand the different stages of fire development. The containers use wood, pallets, and a road flare to help firefighters see the cause and effects of fire inside of structures. This is one of the safest, most cost-effective ways to train firefighters and can be used for multiple evolutions. Flashover exposure has increased over the year. Why? I touched on it earlier. We have better turnouts. Firefighters are putting themselves in harm's way unknowingly because they are so well encapsulated. Faster notification. We're arriving on scene now when the size it may be, I have a single family dwelling with heavy smoke showing. Paints a different picture. Has flashover occurred? Probably not. There's also the better insulation. Homes are built better with better insulation. Again, saving on heating costs but not so great for firefighters. That thermal feedback will occur more rapidly. The combustible items, again, these plastics, synthetics will create a lot more BTUs. Know what you're going into. Sometimes the sign out in front of the structure will tell you what's going on inside of that building. It's important to know the point of no return. The NFPA says that a firefighter can travel 2.5 feet a second and has two seconds to exit when flashover occurs. Put those together, Escape is only possible if you're not more than five feet into that structure. What are some of the survival techniques as firefighters can do to increase your survivability of a flashover? Well, the NFPA recommends that you always work in teams, two in, two out. Again, firefighters that are caught in a flashover become disoriented and panicked. So it's very important to work as a team and stay together. It's also important to find that secondary means of egress before entering the building. Many firefighters that are caught in a flashover have to bail out either a different door or a window besides the one they went in on. Obviously, don't remove your face piece. Your full PPEs are your best protection if flashover does occur. And really, what we're trying to get out of this training is to make good, sound decisions based on risk versus gain. Okay? What are you risking going into that structure? Do you really need to put yourselves in harm's way by going into that structure? What are the goals of flashover training? Well, it's very important to understand and recognize the signs leading up to an impending flashover. We also want to provide firefighters nozzle techniques to cool those gases down below their ignition temperatures, giving firefighters a chance to, number one, escape, two, maybe effect a rescue of one of our own, three, find the seat of the fire, and four, get vertical ventilation done, or five, control the environment itself. Again, our ultimate goal of this training is we want to save firefighters from injury and death due to flashover. I want to thank you for attending this webinar on flashovers and again, train as if your life depends on it because it does. Thank you and stay safe. You can rewatch this webinar along with our other webinars at www.drager.com. The keyword search is webinars. There you can find all the informational webinars that we have done including HCNCO as well as this one on the dangers of flashovers. You can also go there to ask Craig Nielsen a question. Please feel free to search the Draeger website to find more information on our Draeger Swede Survival Flashover Simulators, along with the other products that Draeger offers. Draeger is committed to providing the industry with fire safety education through a variety of programs, such as this webinar series. 
So let's get right to it and answer a question. Craig, uh, a question came in that said, uh, what would you recommend as the single most important thing when teaching young firefighters in flashover recognition? The single most important thing would be recognizing the changing smoke conditions, and that's what I call or what I refer to as reading the smoke. And there are many other things that I pointed out in the, in the lecture as far as signs and symptoms, but the single most, I think, most important thing is to identify um, that changing smoke condition. And the only way to do that is to actually see the smoke and how it does change. Great. Another one came in is uh, that isn't a delayed flashover outside of a compartment actually flame extension from the compartment fire? It is actually flame extension from the compartment, but the compartment lights all at once, therefore igniting the gases that have accumulated outside of the structure all at once. So it's more of a, a flash effect. In other words, it changes from smoke or gas, which is synonymous, to flames in just a matter of seconds. Right. And uh, also another one came in here is, how hot does it get into, uh, get into the flashover box? And what is the temperature difference from the floor to the roof? Well, in the flashover chamber, as, as anyone who's been inside, you're actually below the floor level. And at floor level, the temperatures can reach approximately 12 to 1,500 degrees. And the students are, again, situated below the floor level, where temperatures reach between 4 to 500 degrees. I see here that another one came in here. CO has a big flammable range, but what amount of CO is produced in a normal compartment fire? Mm, I, I actually would have to do some investigation on that one. <laughs> okay, we'll <laughs> to get back to that one. actually measure the amount of CO in a normal fire. Okay. Uh, here's another one that came in. How does vertical ventilation help with preventing flashover? Um, as you can see during the seminar or during the webinar, I actually has some pictures that show how heat and smoke generates. It all flows through the path of least resistance. In other words, it's going to go up. And if there is no vertical ventilation or horizontal ventilation, that heat smoke will then bank downward, again, heating all the components within the room. Well, if you have vertically ventilated that room, again, that heat and smoke will follow the path of least resistance, and it will go out that hole that you just made, and therefore it will not heat all the other components in that room, and you could possibly delay or prevent flashover from occurring. Great. Here's another one that just jumped in here. Uh, how does using foam instead of water, affect the initial knockdown of a pre-burn rollover? Um, well, I think foam has a more penetrating effect um, on the materials there. So it would lay more of a blanketing effect, and you wouldn't have the heat to regenerate like it would through normal water. Great. Well, I think that's uh, that's all that's the time we have for tonight. Again, uh, on behalf of Drager, I want to thank uh, thank you for joining tonight's webinar on the dangers of flashovers. Uh, you will now have the opportunity to rewatch this webinar at our website at www.drager, which is D-R-A-E-G-E-R, dot com, and type in webinars in the search box. There, you can replay all of Drager's webinar series, including the webinar series on HCNCO. Craig, again, I want to thank you again for uh, for doing the webinar. Uh, I thought it was very informative, and I think everybody else did too. Uh, I see a lot of great comments coming through the wire here. And uh, and also I'd like to thank all of you for, uh, for joining tonight's webinar. So everyone stay safe out there, and have a great night.